Hello and welcome to the Battle Line Podcast, where we have conversations on that collision of space between community, faith, and culture. I'm one of your hosts, Matt Satterley, and here with me is the incredible, the amazing, the wonderful editor of Peer Magazine, the co-host on this podcast, the co-host with me in life, Jamie Satterley. Jamie, how are you doing today? <laughs> I'm doing great. <laughs> awesome. We also have with us here the wonderful, the incredible, the double handshake, what's up, super excited co-host and producer, the one who really, ladies and gentlemen, makes this entire thing run, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, how are you doing today? I am so super swell. Awesome. <laughs> All right. In today's episode, we're going to talk about some assumptions that people have about heaven and hell. Dun, so, dun, dun. Yeah, there are uh, some stereotypes that have been shaped by, you know, legend, by pop culture, not necessarily as we'll see from the Bible. So we're going to take three common misconceptions about heaven and about hell. Matt, um, did a super uh, scientific study through <laughs> social media where you just right. ask people like, hey, what are what are misconceptions that you've heard uh, or that maybe you had, or that young people under your care had. Um, so what are those things? And so we took the most common, the three most common um, that we heard about heaven and about hell, and we're going to see um, how they look in the light of the truth of God's mm -hmm. word. Right. So yeah, you're exactly right, uh, Jamie. Thank you. So we did a, an informal poll. We just sort of said, hey, what are all teenagers, if, if you're in youth ministry, you know this, all teenagers want to talk about one of three things, heaven and hell. They want to talk about angels and demons, and they want to talk about the end of the world all the time. Yeah, that's, that's my that's favorite. super fascinating. Hey, kids, that. what should we study next? And they're like, Revelation. Revelation. Like, oh, and, and anybody who's ever taught Revelation <laughs> is like, oh, Lord, here we go. Like, How about uh, we talk about Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So um, I asked the question out there on social media, like, what are some misconceptions that your youth have about heaven and about hell? So again, we got a lot of responses and we could not possibly do all of them. So um, we just kind of narrowed them down to three three areas, because a lot of them were double coverage, that kind of stuff. Um, and so if we don't get to yours, we're sorry. But here's the cool thing. You have a Bible at home. You can look it up yourself and uh, find this. Now, again, as we get going, please know uh, that uh, I am uh, pretty passionate about this. So yes. if I get uppity, oh. <laughs> uh, help me out, Captain Jamie and Elizabeth. Sign. Well, Cap Jamie's giving me a look right now. What do you want? What do you? Yeah. So an informal, kind of an informal conversation. Right. Lighthearted, but also opening the Bible to say, what what does it say about these misconceptions? For sure. Yeah. As we go about this, that is the purpose. We've said this multiple times, but again, hear us again. That's the purpose of this podcast is not to be able to answer all things, but to get conversations started. Teenagers, kids, youth leaders, adults, they want to just have a conversation where they feel like they're heard. And that's what the that's what this podcast is positioned to do. Get a conversation started. Yeah, it's All a right. great side note for youth leaders. Sometimes we feel as the leader that we're supposed to have all the answers. And the kids, especially Gen Z, doesn't necessarily feel the same that same way. They're not necessarily looking for us to say, here's the truth, go follow it, which is we never want to do that anyway. We want them we want to share the truth, but also have them arrive at that conclusion on their own through their own study and those kind of things. Uh, but they just want to talk about it. They want to hear your thoughts and your opinions how you came to that conclu that conclusion, and then, you know, be guided in that way themselves. All right, here we go. First, we're going to go through heaven. I'll start with the good. Start with the good news. All right, so here's the first misconception that we have. Again, we tied some together. Number one, heaven is boring. All we're going to do is sit on clouds all day and play a harp and read uh, old magazines. The Bible, from probably, from they publishing think. Publishing Clinghouse, right. <laughs> Publishers clearing house. <laughs> All right. So here's my first thing. All right. Here's if, if you're one well, of also, these. I think they say like, because we talk about there's imagery in the Bible that talks about, you know, praising God and all these kind of things. And so I think that young people have the misunderstanding that heaven is just going to be like one long praise and worship set. Right. Like it'll right. be oceans from now <laughs> one until it'll be it'll forever. just be one it'll just be one verse also oceans. i'm just gonna say if uh if that is the case then cat matt can't, <laughs> would you still feel like you were in heaven if it was oceans that was played the whole time <laughs> <laughs> don't don't put me out there like that cat jamie right now oh. all right so here's the first thing um if you think that heaven is boring i'm gonna say this to you first you really let the devil play you 
if you think that heaven is boring, you got played like a $2 general fiddle. If you think that heaven is going to be boring. Remember, the Bible says, John 8, 44, that the devil is a liar and the king of all liars. And he has convinced you that hell, because we're going to talk about this and when we get to hell, uh, misconceptions, that hell is a cool place to hang out and heaven is boring. Why you got to let the enemy play you like that? All right. It doesn't. The, the word doesn't say anything about that, like uh, about heaven being bory, boring. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has possibly conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. There are many cultures throughout history that have heaven uh, up in the sky, right? And we see that in scripture. I think that's where this misconception comes from. You see it in the book of Luke, Daniel, Matthew, Mark, Acts, Revelation. When when heaven is talked about, it's talked about as a sky and, and clouds, uh, come from that. So I think that's where this misconception comes from is that when people see clouds of heaven, they think, okay, we'll just be sitting in the clouds all day. I mean, Google it, right? Google what heaven looks like. You're going to see blue sky, white clouds, a golden gate, some St. Peter guy standing outside like a divine bouncer, right? Just checking IDs on the way in. Yeah, I think um, it, it is interesting, you know, like where did this thought come from that this is kind of going to be the thing. And I think a lot of it, like you say, it is pop culture. It's, you know, maybe, maybe because we don't understand heaven and hell, it's people are uncomfortable teaching about it perhaps in the church. And so that makes it easier for all these misconceptions to come into place because there's not always a real solid understanding. Um, so I, I think, um, yeah. It, and I think, I've, I've been thinking about this because my kids have been having a lot of conversations about heaven lately. And in particular, the fear of eternity. Like we're going to be doing the same thing for forever. There's no end. The fact that there's no end is frightening. But I think that we have to, that's our human minds, right? We have to understand that our human minds are not like this goes against everything we believe as humans, because our humanity wants to believe that we can understand and that we have all these capabilities. But our human minds don't understand everything uh, that that there is about God and about his creation and about the way he works. We just can't, we're not physically capable of doing that. Um, and so it's scary to us. What we don't know, what we don't understand is scary. Um, but you don't have to be uh, afraid. I think the way that I think about heaven is that all of the things that I love and enjoy here on earth are but a shadow, right? A shadow of things to come. Um, it's like looking through a foggy window. Right. Um, so it, all those things, you know, about um, all the goodness of God's creation that we see and enjoy and love here is going to in, in my mind is going to, it's going to be like that in heaven, but magnified Good. in a way that, uh, we can't understand or, you know, or, or uh, like we can't conceive of in our mind. Um, it's a perfect segue, Captain Jamie, to what the word says, what heaven will, <clears throat> what we can kind of see it like is Revelation 21 uh, verses one and two about how the new heaven and the new earth have passed away. And we've seen, listen too, we're going to get to this, but you never see heaven and hell in the same verse in the Bible. It doesn't happen. Heaven is contrasted with earth. So when we see it in Revelation 21, heaven and earth, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And then we will see the holy city in Revelation 21 coming down. So it's almost like heaven is coming to, as Captain Jamie just said, a restored, a made right. perfect earth. So, in the way that it was created to be to before be, and, um, you know, brokenness and all that entered the world, God's perfect creation. Colors will be brighter. Things will be clear. We will and 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 when we discover like, think about the sense of awe and wonder that we see in the earth now. Wait till all of the junk is cleared away and the awe and the wonder that we'll behold and see each time. We will see things newer and bigger and clearer and discover it more and more each day. If there are days, right? There will be no more day, I guess. So I shouldn't say days, but for our concept of time, like it will, we will just see him bigger and better. There's, there's a, uh, uh, we're going to reference it a lot, but the book, the last battle by CS Lewis has like a allegory of this read the last battle by CS Lewis. It's a Chronicles of Narnia series. You'll see what we're talking about. If you think heaven is going to be boring, 
to be honest with you folks, and we'll get there in a second, hell will be boring. Uh, definitely. All right. Now we move to misconception number two, and that's where we get, again, this view. This kind of ties into one, but this Greek view of heaven, where heaven is like Mount Olympus, right? Like from right. the Hercules like everybody's movie. Everybody's sitting on the clouds, and there's like these little <laughs> cherub guys in diapers pillars. with their little harp yeah. flying by, and they're just kind of like, Cupid ah. goes by in a diaper, People right? Grapes. Like, like, uh, Gosh, uh, heaven, a sky, clouds, a mountain uh, with clouds enveloping the mountain, birds' wings. I don't know where in the world, folks, we got up with the idea that bird wings represent angels, right? White bird wing feathers Caca! Uh, for <laughs> angels. And then demons, they get bat wings. I guess it's just because as humans, we don't like bats. Bat was the reason for the coronavirus. <laughs> so Stop. we just say. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> so we just say bat wings have are like demons. So I don't know where that stuff comes from. All right. But here's here's what makes me laugh about this misconception number two about this view of heaven of just being sky clouds thing. We think God took meticulous creation of the earth, right? Took him six days. And then we were like, okay, God made everything, all the animals, all the plants. He did all this wonderful creation. And then when we're going to spend eternity with the Lord, God was like, I'm, you know what? I'm just going to make some sky and some clouds. I'm going to call it a day. <laughs> Good That's enough. Right. No, I come on, the, guys. That's ridiculous. You think the wings? I think the wings thing could come from Isaiah, where it talks about the seraphim, maybe, right. and the wings. And so I think that we just kind of think like, okay, that's a being. Yeah. Have that's, you say it's around the throne of God? <laughs> it has wings, so all the things all that are around wings. God have wings. Like we, we just. We, we misapply exactly. teachings from one portion of scripture, and we just think that it has to apply to all these different things. And that's not necessarily I, true. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie, I mean, you, you said it right. Exactly. Like, have you seen the angels in Ezekiel chapter one, like where it's talk about, they have the face of an ox and the face of a lion and six wings and eyes and all these things. Yeah, so, that is totally not a cute little cherub chubby baby. Flying no, it's so air. funny that like, we, t we, we parcel things out, right? So like we'll, we'll take, we're not going to keep the ox face, but we'll keep <laughs> the wings. So our angel's going to look angels like- angels don't have cow faces. That's right. They look like Fabio. So we're, <laughs> we're going to say, he looks like Fabio, but we're going to bring the wings over yeah. and, and put that on there. Uh, right. Yeah. It's- that, that That's funny. Yeah. It's a danger that we see in all of scripture, not even, not just in this particular topic, um, but- like all over is where we we take things out of context or you know misapply take a concept from here and think it has to apply over here um you know yes the bible was inspired by god but it's written by different authors about different topics and subjects and and while it is uh there is continuity and there are things that apply from every single one you can't take the image uh a vision from isaiah over here and just apply that right. to you every single like thing from there on out. Uh, just because the seraphim had wings doesn't mean that every being in heaven has wings. And when we see the angels sitting in the empty tomb with Jesus, uh, sorry, with Jesus not being there in the gospels, um, we see, it just says there were two men dressed in white, like their clothes were of lightning, but that's all it says. It doesn't say that there were like, you know, Leonard Skinner, eagle wings on the back of the... And I feel like angel. that's something they would have mentioned had it been the case. For sure. And that's what, like, you see you it say, in A scripture. man with wings, that's a pretty... Right. I mean, like, you, that's a good, somebody, that's important detail. Hey, yeah, would have missed that, you know. <laughs> All right. Like, oh, I wasn't paying that much attention. I didn't see the wings. <laughs> All right. Well, let's do our last misconception about heaven. And this one hopefully doesn't offend anybody, but it's just what we got to say, okay? Well, it's a, it's a good kind of... Uh, derives from point two or we're talking about this why do people think that angels have wings all right here yeah the third heaven misconception was that my family members who have died my friends who have passed away or have become, really any person that dies, any person has died, becomes an angel when they die the bible does not say that to us at all it says that th there are two separate beings that are created there are angels that have been created, and there is man who has been created. And man does not become an angel when he dies. You see this in Psalm 8, verses 4 and 5. And this is, again, reiterated by whoever wrote Hebrews. Hebrews says this, he made him a little lower than the angels. Go ahead, Captain Jamie. No, I was just going to say, yeah. So the, the Bible does talk about um, uh, like how our 
just in the same way that earth will be restored, our bodies will be restored, but it's not restoring us to another being, right? Uh, to an angel. Like it's not a transformation, a metamorphosis from person to angel. We're not caterpillars who right. become butterfly angels. Yeah, that sounds like just, a song by a famous, you know, that's the next praise and worship song. Butterfly angels. Stop, stop. <laughs> Yeah. Singing it every episode. <laughs> the uh, yeah. So so while our you know we, there will be restoration of the body and healing of the body, it's not a transformation into an angel. You don't suddenly look like Fabio with wings, right? Sorry right. to say. It does say in Matthew twenty two verse thirty. It does say they will be like the angels in heaven, and I think that's where again this misconception has come from. But it's talking about how you know we will be. Not we won't be. It doesn't say we will be angels in heaven. It just says we will be like angels in heaven who get to see God's face all the time. Yeah, and it doesn't. It doesn't say in what way we'll be like the angels. Good, so good. you know, it could be that in um, in action and the things that we do, or in the way that they behold the glory of God, or they're in His presence and those kind of things. It doesn't necessarily mean be like the angels in that physically like the angels. Um, as we wrap up here, these misconceptions about heaven. I will finish with this about. Uh, what happens when we die, not being angels. I have given instructions to my wife that when I pass away, that when I die, my face is to not be airbrushed on a t-shirt <laughs> with angel bird wings coming out of a picture from me that was taken in 1987. I'm do it just like you, man. <laughs> angel wings and a gold halo around it. And it says, RIP, Matt. Like, I do not want any airbrush. Hey, listen, listen, listeners. If there's an airbrushed t-shirt of my face when I pass away and go to heaven, I... I will ask the Lord if I can come back and haunt you <laughs> for for such a problem, for such a mystery. I'm gonna when, do I, it. when I pass I'm away, do I've told my wife, and hey, I, I, there's nothing morbid about thinking about your funeral. Okay, this is fine. You're planning ahead, and you know it's fine. All right. When I die, I've already told Captain Jamie I want a funny picture of me up hanging by the but coffin. not an airbrushed one. Not an, oh, if it's airbrushed, I will haunt you. <laughs> So uh, a funny picture of me and like, you know, giving a thumbs up or something like that and the most goofiest smile. And everybody gets cookies and milk. That's what I've told her. Everybody gets cookies and milk on the way out. It's going to be a party. If you cry at my funeral, I will come and haunt you. And if you dare have the audacity to airbrush my face. Everybody's wear, getting an airbrush t-shirt or oh, like a little pin that they can put on there. No, suit when they, no, I will come and haunt you all good. You're going to be in the service notes. and the lights are going to start flicking on and off. They're like, here's Matt. He's mad because we airbrush his face on a wall. All right. So again, lots about heaven, but we had to narrow it down, um, had to run through it. All right. Now we really got some messed up <laughs> ideas when we talk about hell. All right. With some really jacked up ideas. So here's the first one. We have three hell misconceptions. Here's number one. Satan has a red suit, a pointy tail, he has horns, he carries a pitchfork, he's a black, he has a black handlebar mustache, uh, and he is the king in hell. I think if you think that's what the devil looks like, you're thinking of like the Arizona State mascot or something like that, the yeah, sun I mean, devils, right? That, that's a way that he's been commonly depicted in um, art or uh, lots of times in cartoons. You know, you have like the little... Um, when when somebody is wrestling with a decision, right. angel on one like a little good angel and then the little devil. And you have to differentiate between the two. So the devil gets the little pronged tail and horns and right. um, you know, the angel gets the nice toga and which what's not uh, the toga? Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. The I don't back know. to Greek. <laughs> yeah. Back to the Greek toga view. and uh wings and that's how you differentiate between the two you do see a lot the king and hell thing um i was just thinking about this with the music video that just came out recently by little nas x and the same thing montero in, yeah when he um when he in the video when he goes into hell satan is sitting there on a, a throne, throne um which red red skin yeah. painted red black horns all the, there's that stereotype again yeah so i think it's you know, it's derived from art and pop culture and all those kind of things. But we have to remember that just because that's the way people have chosen to illustrate things in the past doesn't make it true. Right. Um, again, things that we don't understand, we feel like we have to do something to wrap our mind around it. And so we create, you know, these these images and these things. But just because that's historically 
uh, through art and things that have, you know, have come through doesn't make, make it true. You have to line it up with what the word of God says, not what, you Which know, says the, the devil Metropolitan goes around museum of art is displaying or whatever. Exactly. And the word says the devil goes around masquerading as an angel of light. One, two, he goes around as a roaring lion. Two, three, he goes around as a great dragon. I've told people a hundred million times, um, the best way to portray the devil, I would love to see a play or a musical or some sort of show one day where the, the enemy is dressed and a nice business suit, blonde like, hair. Like Brad Pitt. Looks like Brad Pitt. Like a guy that – that's what the devil – he has some sort Just of like attraction handsome, kinda to handsome, kind of has that swagger. Him. He used to be an angel, folks. He used to be an angel, and yet we've made him grotesque and all this stuff, it, which is ridiculous. So let me – I'm going to go on a rant here. Just give me like a couple of <laughs> seconds just to go off because I have some when, – when young people say this is what the devil's like, I would just want to say a few things. Number one, we give the devil way too much power, right. right? We give him way too much power. The devil is not omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. That only God is those things. Omniscient, he knows all, th God knows all things. The devil does not know all things, okay? He doesn't read your mind. Number two, he's not everywhere at all times. This bothers me so much that people think <laughs> that the devil is everywhere. When there's Tristan or Megan out there and they're like, the devil is just really working me right now. I'm having a hard time. No, you stubbed your toe this morning on the way out. That's not the devil. You just stubbed your toe or you didn't take your Claritin today. And that's why you have a sinus headache. <laughs> Okay. That's not the devil. You didn't go to, you didn't get eight hours sleep. You ate crap. You don't eat good food. And you keep saying the devil is really on me. No, Megan, no, Tristan, no, Kyle. That's just you, bro. Making That's bad just choices. You, sis. Okay. So stop all this. The devil is just really, he, devil's really hurt on the we Sunday morning. We give the morning. devil a lot more power in our lives than what he actually has. He cannot be everywhere at all times. And he's not all powerful. Okay. Yeah. Only God is that. And when we dare to put Satan on the same level as Jesus, are you kidding me? No. If Satan is on the same level of anything, he'd be on the same level as Michael or Gabriel. And in Revelation 20, it says an unnamed angel, an angel who doesn't even get a name in scripture comes down with the key and ties up the devil. Folks, hear me. Listen, to Uncle Matt. I, my wife's giving me a look like you got to chill out. <laughs> you are giving too much power to Satan. Stop saying the devil is doing this to me. No, he's not. No, he's not. He, he, he is a real, uh, he does exist. Yeah. Right. There's this one other, the other extreme is to go is to say he's, he's all symbolic. It's all figurative. He does exist and he does have power, but he's not after you because you crashed your Toyota Camry. What does that do in the span of things? Listen to me. I love you. You, the devil has bigger fish to fry than to have you stub your toe on a Sunday morning before you go to the core or kick the cat. Relax. This PSA brought to you by... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so definitely there are forces at work. We we understand and know that, you know, the devil uh, has, you know, we, we call them demons. It helps us to understand. Um, and there, there well, are... We see in scripture, yes, right? You say, yeah. yeah. There are forces um, of darkness and there's temptation and then there's all these things. But we, uh, the, and those, you know, temptation in our lives, things that, that are, are wanting to pull us away from God. Yes. But it is heresy for us to believe that Satan is equal in power to Jesus. Exactly. Uh, Satan you. is not, just like Matt said, he is not equal in power. He does not have the same um, strengths and the same abilities and all of those kind of things um, that, that Jesus as part of the, the Trinity, God, the father and God, the son and God, the Holy spirit have the, uh, you know, they, they are co-equal in power and glory. The three, not the four. Right. You know, Satan is not like up there on the same level as Jesus or the Holy Spirit or whatever. And and then he, you know, just messed up. And so they kicked him out, but he still retains his power. Uh, no, he, like Matt said, uh, is had, you know, would be like an angel, which do not have the same power and glory that right. God does. Not omniscient, not omnipresent, no. not so omnipotent. We need to make sure that that we are not allowing that kind of heresy into our lives or into our thinking or giving Satan more power. Certainly we need to be on guard against um you know the temptations Bible, in our lives that, and right? yep yeah, and the, you know um evil and all of those kind of things. But stop just stop the temptation to believe that Satan is equal in power 
to God. Yeah, South Park, The Simpsons, these shows show Jesus and the devil like wrestling and stuff like that. It's ridiculous that any point that Jesus, Jesus could just say a word and it could go away. All right. There's and it not, will. It, we, it yes. will at one day. And we'll talk about that uh, in point two. There will come a day uh, when God says enough is enough. But I'm probably going to start bleeding into point two no, here. Well, well, let's go. Let's go into it. Let's just jump right into it. Because again, uh, my passion is going to get up on point two, too. So two, two, <laughs> not two, two as well. All right. And here's the second misconception of hell. And this one, again, it's going to set me off. It's going to set me over because people say this all the time. Here it is. A loving God wouldn't send people to hell. Do you want to go first, Captain Jamie? Or do you want you want Uncle Matt to get riled up? What do you want me to do? No, so I was just going to say, as continuing in what I was saying, is that, um, you know, there will come a time, we know this, the Bible talks about it, there will come a time when God says, you know, enough. Enough mm. is enough. Um, but Second Peter two, or, yeah, Second Peter 3 tells us um, that um, the, the Lord is not slow to keep his promise. He's patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but wanting everyone to come to repentance. And so we, we say, okay, well, if God, if God can just put an end to it, why doesn't he? And it's because God wants, he does not want anyone to perish. He does not want anyone to be absent from him. God loves all of us as hard as it is to believe. He loves every single person person. Uh, He wants everyone to be in relationship with him, but it is by our own choosing that we choose not to follow or we choose, you know, to separate ourselves. There will come a day um, when, when God says, okay, you know, I've given you opportunity, but he does not. And so I think, you know, that's why there's a delay. He does not want anyone to perish, but to have the opportunity to repent and to be in fellowship with him. But it is our own choice. There it is. That separates there us from is. God. And if we choose, this is kind of where I get a little bit confused. If we choose to separate ourselves from him in life, why would why would we want to be con- counted with him in death? Boom. Captain Jamie nailed it. And I, th- I mean, it's because we don't want to, we don't want to go to hell, right? Like you don't want to go to hell. So you, I don't want to live a life for God in my life, but I want all the benefits. You know, I want the, I want the relationship after life. I don't want to do it in life. And that's not the way it works. Hell just was, not. Cre- hell was created for the devil and his angels. Right. And then people say, well, a loving God wouldn't send people there. And this is where I get again, frustrated at the audacity of us as human beings. God, we we assume that hell is an underground torture chamber, which who said first off that hell is underground, right? It's talked about the Valley of Gehenna is what Jesus talks about, which we can talk about that in a minute. I think it also talks about uh, because of the Apostles Creed where it talks about he descended and descended into hell. Sure. But we think like if I dig a hole deep enough, one day I'll get to hell. Right. Uh, No, you you can't dig your way to hell. (laughs) Yeah. God. I mean, you can figuratively, but not physically. Yeah, I hear you. Nice. (laughs) That was a good. If you're looking for a sermon, Captain Jamie just gave you the. You can use it. You don't have to give me uh, attribution. So the assumption is God locks the door from the outside that God is some sort of uh, enjoys throwing us in. He's like some sort of, de, uh, he gets pleasure. He's a masochist. He gets pleasure out of us suffering in hell. That God locks the door from the outside of hell. He throws people in, he shuts the door, and he locks the door. Absolutely not. Hell is a coffin from which we latch ourselves in from the inside. We choose to go to hell every single day by the decisions that we make. What we're saying is not your will be done. C.S. Lewis says it great. He says there are two types of people in the world. Those who say to the Lord, thy will be done. And then those people that the Lord has to say to them, thy will be done. And we choose hell every single day when we choose things opposite of the good that he has for us. When we choose life for our, or what we want for ourselves. So don't you dare sit there and have the audacity to say, why would a loving God send us to hell when we are making the decisions and shutting the door ourselves into hell by the decisions that we make and we lock the door and hold the key in our own pocket when we lock ourselves in hell. And then we have the audacity to say, why would a loving God send us here? 
Absolutely not, folks. Yeah. God Absolutely doesn't send – people make that decision for themselves in this we, life. It's like it's we – It's not it, God's choice. The word says it's that. God it, – again, in Second Peter, it says, it is not God's will that any should perish. Thank you. Right? It's it, not – that is not – it's not – Part of something that he enjoys or something that he wants it is a decision. It's what if where free will comes in, you know, comes into play. We have the choice to decide how we're going to live our lives. Are we going to live life with Christ? Are we going to live life without it? If we choose to live without it, then you choose to live without it. Let me put it to you like this. We talked about summer camp last last uh, episode. All of us have been sat around a campfire and made s'mores. Now, let's think it's not summer. It's like winter, fall, whatever. We're all sitting around a campfire, okay? We feel the warmth of the campfire when we're sitting around it. But to retreat from the campfire, to back off from the campfire is to enter the cold, correct? To back away from the campfire is to enter the cold. When we choose every single day to withdraw from the light, to withdraw from the campfire and enter into the cold, we cannot say, why would God do this when we have made the decision ourselves to withdraw from the campfire, to withdraw from the light and enter the cold? But it's in our human nature to pass the blame onto somebody else. Adam and Eve did it. The devil, remember, that was the first one, Eve. Adam, they asked Adam, she made me do it, right? She offered it to me. And then what's Eve say? Well, the, this, the devil literally made me do this. So... We have got to stop this. Uh, why would a loving God send us people there, folks? We have to understand we choose that. And Jamie said it perfectly. We choose it, but here's the great thing. While we are alive, we have the opportunity to all of a sudden stop and say, Jesus, we've been living for ourselves. We believe in your death on the cross for us to redeem us from all that, to bring us back to the campfire and back to his light. We trust in his resurrection who conquered death and hell as we're talking about and can make us a new creation in him. So uh, this loving God would send people there is just, I didn't mean to get like that. It just sets me off because again, we have the audacity to make, we want to have our cake and eat it too is what it is. We want to make our own choices and then have again, the audacity to look at God and say, why would you do that? You sent me here. And he's like, no. You chose this. I have handed you over. God does not torture them. It doesn't say anywhere in scripture that God is doing a torturing in hell. And by the way, we're going to get there. There's a, the word torture is not used there. It's torment, which we'll talk about in a different, in a second, but God hands them over to their desire. He loves us so much. Jamie said it earlier. He lets us choose. All right. Sorry. Last one, last one. And again, this one, I don't, don't know where these come from, but the, the last misconception of hell is this, that hell is going to be a party at all times, just an underground party, just a party in a cave somewhere, right? Sex, drugs, rock and roll, uh, all the stuff's going to take place there. Uh, there'll be, you know, there'll be some, you're going to get poked in the side by a demon, I guess, every once in a while. But for the most part, all my friends are going to be there. We're, it's like we're going to be shooting pool. That's what we think. Well, we'll I think it's like pool, the flip side beer. of the coin from our first point about heaven is right. that, okay, heaven is going to be, you know, boring. a long praise and worship set. It's going to be boring. We just, you know, it's like a, one long church service. That's what we think. Heaven is one long church service. So the opposite, what is the opposite of that is like this rock and roll party with, you know, sex and drugs and Metallica or whatever. Yeah, there's... So, uh, there was the, a fa- I was just yeah. going to say, Kevin James, just to say, there's a famous interview. I watched it just last night, just again, to confirm it. Freddie Mercury, remember the lead singer of, of Queen? He was asked, hey, uh, are you going to get to heaven? This was an interview. And he said, do you want to go to heaven? And he said, no. And he said, well, do you, why do you, you want to go to hell? Why do you want to go to hell? He said, oh, hell is much better. Look at all the interesting people that you'll meet there. And th- that just, that, that misconception, as Jamie has just said, has just filtered its way through uh, through us. Continue, Jamie, please. Yeah, no. So I was just going to say that it's not um, as an inaccurate view of what hell is going to be like. To be sure, we don't, there are not a lot of details. We don't have a lot of details. It talks about, like Matt said, it talks about torment. Um, but it's, we, we need to understand hell as the complete absence of God. And yes. then also, the, that means the complete absence of of all of the goodness of God. Mm. So love and relationship. All of those kind of things will not exist. So uh, utter despair 
and loneliness. Uh, those kind of, which really sounds like the opposite of a party to me. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, the, the, one of the best uh, things we have is Jesus told a parable about Lazarus and the rich man. If you don't know this parable, you need to look it up. It's in Luke chapter 16, uh, verses 19. Yeah, 19 through the end of the chapter. But we see there about a little bit about heaven and hell. And we don't know, again, it's it's, a, it's uh, Jesus tells his parable. Right? So yeah. we have to understand. But Captain Jamie is right. Okay, guys, like there will be no shooting pool and hanging out with friends in heaven. You're not in hell, excuse me. Like it will be a place of utter darkness and isolation, a loneliness not felt here on the earth. Cause even here we have the Lord's prevenient grace, right? Like he's, we still have the the sun on our face. We still, even if you're are lonely, like you still get the feel, you wake up each morning, you feel the sun on your face. There's Netflix, right? There's stuff, there's stuff Family out there. Family and yeah, relationship. Right. And but people. no friendships. There is no friendships in hell. There are no good times in hell. It's a place of utter darkness, utter darkness, a fire that doesn't produce light, but, uh, uh, just a a despair and a loneliness and a and just an a, a, such a feeling of just being alone. And uh, we talked. We said we we're going to talk about it. People say it's where I'm going to be tortured. Tortured is not used in the Bible at all. The word torture. It the Jesus says it as a place of torment. Let me just give you the quick quick summary of these words. Torture is something externally that happens to you. You are tortured, right? When we hear about teaching people being tortured, they're being something on the outside of them is happening to them. Torment is what you do when it's internal, when your own thoughts and your own feelings, when like something, you know, when you like are embarrassed, right? And you think back, you cringe of something you did years ago, you're tormenting yourself from what you did. That's what hell is the Bible says it's not a place of torture. It's a place of torment where internally we remember all the times that we said to him, no, I'll do it my way. And because of we are tormented of that. So this misconception that hell is a party and heaven is boring. You got that backwards, bro. Heaven's an awesome party and hell is a place of abject loneliness and boredom and despair. I think too that so part of the reason that it's going to be with that torment is because we were created for community, right? We were created and from the beginning of time when it said, you know, it's not good for man to be alone. And so a uh, woman was created. We could do a whole topic about this because that word right there is not a uh, help helper mm. in the way that we understand it, Put but it a strong list. warrior, right? A strong warrior to, to be in life with. Um, and then we see it throughout the Bible. We talk about the church, how they lived in community together and acts in the, the early days of the church um, and how that's God. Um, in John 17, I believe, where uh, Jesus is praying and he's talking about wanting um, his disciples to be in unity together, just like there's a unity um, in the Trinity and that the relationship of the Trinity between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Um, that perfect unity. He wants that for his disciples, for the believers. We were created for community. And so to be in a place where that d does not exist, where we cannot have that, there's the absence of God, the absence of relationship, the absence of love. Um, that's where the utter torment comes in because we're existing in a state that we were never created for. It's the opposite of what we were created for. Um, and so you know, that, that utter torment of what it'll be like to not have any of that is hell. Yeah. Let, we're not going to end on this because we're going to, we're going to pull this plane out of its nosedive because we don't want to end on there. But cause listeners, you know, this, and this is why the Salvation Army exists to tell people that Jesus came to save us from ourselves, came to save us from our mess. And by accepting him as our Lord and Savior by saying, Lord, you're more important than me, Jesus. You are more important. I need you to make, help me make the decisions every single day. By believing in his death on that cross that redeems of, us of our sin, that, 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 and then his resurrection, as Captain Jamie said, uh, uh, the, the creed, the Apostles' Creed, right, Captain Jamie, where it says he descended into hell and 
saved us. He resurrected. He conquered death and hell and sin. And if we trust in him and in his life and in his resurrection, then we will be saved. We will be made a new creation, and we don't have to worry about hell at all. All right? Uh, for further study, we just looked at, I looked at a few books and I wrote them down here that I wanted to give them to you because I know there are people who are interested in reading more. So here's four that you can use. Uh, the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. Uh, great. One of the Screw Tape Letters is, is my uh, second favorite book. You have to, when you're a Christian, you have to say your favorite book is the Bible. <laughs> so <laughs> Screw Tape Letters is, is one of my favorites. Uh, a book called Heaven by Randy Alcorn. It's a little dated now. Here's my one of the best ones, The Skeletons in God's Closet by Joshua Ryan Butler. He talks about hell, he talks about judgment, and he talks about holy war. How these three things as Christians we don't like to talk about. I, I say read that book, The Skeletons in God's Closet by Joshua Ryan Butler. And then the last one, I, we mentioned it in there, The Last Battle by C.S. Lewis. Um, again, A Chronicle of Narnia, the last one. He talks about, he gives an allegory of what heaven, uh, heaven sort of looks like. So check that out. All right. Anything else you want to jump in there, Captain Jamie, and say before we yeah. go around the what gives no, you joy? No, I would just be sure that if you're going to read those, that you choose especially the the correct skeleton in God's closet. Make yes, sure you get the one that's ones. by Joshua, Joshua Ryan, Ryan Butler because there there's a fiction book that's called the same thing, Skeleton in God's Closet. And so if you read that, you'll be really confused about why it doesn't talk <laughs> this about doesn't talk about what, it at all. yeah. You're like ah uh, yeah. Make sure if you I get remember the right that. That's a pretty there. decent book too, though. That's like if like this non. Fic, it's a fiction, a nonfiction book, right? No, no, it's fiction. Fiction book about if they found like they think they found Jesus' bones that he didn't yeah. resurrect. That's a book from the nineties. Throwback. Yeah, so make sure you get the right one. <laughs> <laughs> Joshua Ryan Butler, he's the guy that writes this one. Yep. All right, so we're going to move into our closing segment. Then, what is giving you joy? All right, what is giving you joy, Elizabeth? You want to go first today? Okay. All right. You know the world's favorite boy band, BTS. <laughs> Well, <laughs> they're coming out with a new track called Butter. Butter. <laughs> and I love BTS and I love Butter. So I'm hyped. <laughs> Is, about Is it like, already out? Is it already out? Can I like hear they it? They just released like a little like snippet, you know, like, a teaser. <laughs> Listen, I, a teaser. I think that's the popular thing right now to do with uh, is the name your songs after food. We've got butter, strawberry, strawberry wine for those 90s country <laughs> kids. Oh, wow. We don't believe in wine. We don't. <laughs> the the opinions expressed by <laughs> great. All right, I'm gonna have to check this song out. Is sure. it about butter or is this just a? We don't know. I have no idea what it's about, but it's gonna be a bop, and there's gonna be a. Dance. I leave you on the table, baby. Stop that. Do come to room temperature. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I throw a third, a third, Stop. a cup of you Stop. and flour and Matt. eggs. <laughs> Stop singing. What's your joy? <laughs> um, I'm going to give, all right. So I'm going to be a total homer on this one. Um, Haitian flag day was last week. Um, being from Florida, there's a lot of Haitian salvationists down there. Um, I was inducted really into the Haitian culture when we Haitian lived down there. Haitian by association. That's Haitian what they call by association. I don't know if you don't know this, but Satterley is not a Haitian last name. <laughs> But um, to all my Zoes out there, like uh, Haitian Flag Day, you know, when you're at a Congress and somebody starts singing Oh Boundless Salvation, right? The founder song, there will be that older Salvationist who all of a sudden from their tunic, they pull out a Salvation Army handkerchief flag and they start waving it. Oh, Boundless <laughs> Salvation. Listen, that's Every three. Ha You've met your quota of singing. Every Haitian I have ever met can produce a Haitian flag at any moment. Just go up to a Haitian it's and like say, a magic trick. where's the flag? And somewhere, I don't know where they do it. They have it set, he's, he's secretly hidden, but they'll pull it from somewhere, this Haitian flag, everywhere. So to my Zoes out there, sac passe, and uh, enjoy Haitian flag day, even though it was this last week, yes. and this is already over. <laughs> We're having withdrawals from our uh, beloved no grill, Haitian no, community. No, pickles, no legume. And just the vibe, the vibe that uh, our beautiful Haitians friend, Haitian friends just live with, mm. it is always fun. Always fun. Right. Always Captain good Jamie, times. What's, what's giving you joy? Wrap us up. Uh, so mine this week, I might have said, used this before, but I'm going to use it again. Uh, the weather has been fantastic. And so in the evenings, we have been able to have dinner on the deck in the backyard. Um, and so kind of uh, our backyard, there's a lot of trees like right behind our house. Um, and then we have, you know, some um, 
plants and bushes and things back there. So it's like this little retreat and the weather has just been so nice. Um, and we've been able to grill a lot. Shout out to Captain Matt who grills for me all the time. Um, and it has just been a really great way to kind of relax at the end of a busy work day to enjoy conversation with our kids, uh, watch the crazy dog who's trying to jump around and eating all the cicadas right now. Uh, and so it has just been the perfect, like calming end to a busy day. Um, so that's what has been bringing me joy. Captain Jamie, would you say that days. being in the backyard in the evenings is heaven? Stop. We need to go. You're too much. <laughs> That's going to end this episode of the Battle Line podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the Battle Line wherever you listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out the Peer website, peermag.org. Go check it out. Follow Peer on all the socials at peer.magazine. And lastly, we have a sister podcast called the Fight for Good podcast that's tied to the war cry. Check them out. Until next time, this has been the Battle Line podcast. Bye. Bye. I leave you on the table, baby, to come to room temperature. I throw a third, a third a cup of you in flour and eggs. 